uh, next up is uh, Brandy, Brandy Handback from the, from the Rockefeller Group. Thank you, Brandy. Good afternoon, I'm Brandy Handback with the Rockefeller Group. Uh, if we were in New York or New Jersey, nobody would ask me who the Rockefeller Group is or what we do, but I'm here in Georgia and we've had a number of questions at our booth with people coming up, so I'm excited to tell you about the Rockefeller Group if you haven't heard of us and also announce that we're, we're here and we're here to stay uh, in Atlanta as of January 1 when we opened our office here. So we're excited for you to learn more about us. Uh, the Rockefeller Group is a commercial real estate development company uh, focusing on office and industrial industrial. Uh, we've been around for a long time uh, and now that you know what the Rockefeller Group is, you might wonder why I'm up here and why the Rockefeller Group needs a Vice President of Trade and Logistics. Well, one of the things the Rockefeller Group did back in the mid-70s was have a lot of foresight about what you needed to do to attract tenants, AAA credit, long-term lease tenants, and they understood it had a lot to do with multinational companies, foreign investment, and global trade. Uh, so back in 1978, the company set up one of the first inland foreign trade zones. Inland was defined then as being an hour inland. It was an hour inland of New Jersey at the International Trade Center. And that seemed like the hinderland, and a lot of investors as well as others thought the company was crazy for doing it. Uh, the project was wildly successful over about the next 20 years with lots of multinational companies uh, locating in the park. Uh, it's still a, a thriving park today, and it's been expanded to other parts of New Jersey. Uh, once the company figured out this sort of recipe for success, uh, the management of the company looked out and said, you know, we need to replicate this elsewhere. We don't need to be just known as a New York, New Jersey, Northeast successful commercial developer. So I joined the company about 12 years ago, uh, and at that time they were rolling out what was then coined their port strategy, thinking about how to look at what was done in the Northeast and selectively in key markets tied to port trends and trade trends and foreign investment look over the horizon and see where such projects might be successful in the future. Uh, so first we ventured west, we went to California, and now people in California and Arizona and Utah don't ask who the Rockefeller Group is anymore, they know. We've had some very successful projects out there. And we're now here in the southeast, so we're very excited about partnerships that we have with Mead West Vaco, with Plum Creek. Our newest announcement with Plum Creek, who's also here today, will involve the development of over 4,000 industrial acres in Florida and Georgia, uh, much of which we think is well aligned and positioned for foreign trade zone development, industrial development and taking advantage of a lot of the trends that we've heard about today in terms of ports, uh, trade, and logistics. So that brings into play what I get to do. I work with our tenants as well as select clients so that we want to have strategic relationships with who import and export, some of them manufacture, many of them distribute, to kind of think about how does trade policy intersect with logistics port strategy, and also uh, the notion of industrial development and real estate, and how do those things come together to culminate in an actual supply chain strategy. So I work with our clients on questions about sourcing, uh, as they're looking out at the horizon where they will source in the future, what are the implications for that on things they might not think about? They might find a low labor uh, location, but when they factor in costs of transportation, tariffs, certain trade policy restrictions that might impact the cost of their goods, in some cases can quadruple the cost of their goods or the landed cost that they really haven't fully considered in the question or decision about where to source. Um, and some of the things that come into play here, which I mentioned, are, are both opportunities, like when we think of foreign trade zones, and I'm going to say a few bit uh, more about that, but also restrictions, like anti-dumping. Uh, when the quotas system really started to phase out several years ago, uh, a new sort of uh, protectionism began to creep up in our trade policy, which you may not have heard anything about unless you were unfortunate enough to have a product that you buy suddenly become subject to an anti-dumping duty, which can overnight triple or quadruple uh, the cost of the goods that you're purchasing. From the standpoint of sales, what opportunities are there out there? Uh, I was interested in some of the earlier presentations and looking out over the horizon, we've got a lot of new trade agreements coming into play. Uh, NAFTA, obviously, one that most are familiar with, but the announcement that we might have an EU-US trade agreement in the future. That would be fantastic and would definitely Im impact your supply chains. Certainly for the East Coast ports, lots of opportunities that could uh, arise from that. And manufacturing, frankly, some of which that went to Mexico 
to take advantage of the Mexico-EU free trade agreement now may have reasons for transportation and other considerations, plus the tariff benefits if they are able to supply Europe duty-free. So that may change what you think about in terms of your supply chain and how to adapt and be nimble and where you need to locate distribution and or manufacturing in the future. And then how does that play in in terms of port proximity? Uh, what are the benefits? How close is too close? What are the trade-offs? Uh, do you have a hub, hub and spoke model to sort of get the transloads, get the product out of the containers? Or do you really stage your distribution center network uh, to be able to avoid having to do that but also have adequate turns and supply your customer base, whether that be stores, whether that be consumers, uh, whether that be other distribution centers of customers? So those are all the things that kind of come into play when you think about the intersection of the, the areas that I tend to think about and work within. Uh, one of the things that we talked a little bit about today was the National Freight Network. I think it's going to be very interesting to see. We don't know how that will be funded yet, but the concept of having a real national transportation policy that then ties into these other aspects of infrastructure investment and how do we ultimately define who will be the 30,000 critical miles of roadway that will define and then attract investment for infrastructure to create this national freight network, and how will that impact company site selection decisions uh, in the future? So I think that's going to be a very interesting one to watch. I know, uh, you know, 15 years ago when we were talking about which ports would really uh, become the top ports, and every port had a story. Imagine now trying to translate that into roadway miles, and I can imagine every county, every city, every state is going to have a strategy to make their roadway infrastructure the critical freight infrastructure, but at the end of the day, we know that that won't be the case. So those are important policy discussions that will be taking place uh, as we think about infrastructure investment and really having a competitive national policy for the future. One of the programs I like to talk a lot about uh, is foreign trade zones, so let me just go to the next slide quickly to tee that up. Um, this is an area where there's opportunity, so that's why I like to talk about it, and it's an area where we've learned over the years that even though companies might know something about it, oftentimes the more they know, the less they know. Um, there are, in terms of overall statistics, um, some comfort level that, that companies looking at this should find. The program's been around since 1934, it's not a new program, and as of the last report, year, there was over $640 billion worth of merchandise received in foreign trade zones in the U.S. That's about 12% of total imports. So it's really not as much of a niche as a lot of companies tend to think it is when they think they're venturing into the unknown uh, to consider using something like a foreign trade zone. But when you think about foreign sourcing, foreign sales, having multi-purpose distribution centers, certainly expanding uh, the export concept in terms of your business and marketing, knowing that 95% of the world's consumers are outside of the U.S., and so if you really want to be successful and grow your business, you've got to figure out how to do that, and also understanding that for places like in North America, you know, putting up a Canadian distribution center can also be very expensive and might better be served from a U.S. North American hub something a U.S. foreign trade zone can facilitate and support. Here in Georgia, you might not realize it, but there are three foreign trade zones. Uh, the Georgia foreign trade zones represented here today by Julie Brown. Uh, they represent the greater Atlanta area, I think over 60 counties, did you say? Julie? Yes. Um, they've got over 50 companies that use the zone right here in the greater Atlanta area. Um, there are lots of jobs and investment associated with that and consistently rank in the top 20 states, Georgia does, for the activity in its foreign trade zones. So again, it might be something that you're not familiar with, but in fact, there's quite a lot of activity uh, and success in the use of zones right here in the state of Georgia, and we hope to expand upon that with our future industrial developments. In terms of the benefits, um, customs duties can be deferred. Uh, as Curtis said, in a cross dock, in an air environment, that might not seem very sexy, but actually in foreign trade zones, you can do some very unique um, opportunistic ways of managing your inventory first in, first out by record keeping, not by physical pick and pack. Uh, that means you get ultimate deferral based on a snapshot of everything in the building. Uh, that, when you add up cash flow and savings, can be very significant. Duty reduction, if you're doing any value add, you're kidding, maybe you are manufacturing and making a finished product when the goods come out of the zone and are sold in the U.S., you get the benefit of the lower duty rate applicable to that finished good, even if that finished good is just a kit 
kit or something that was assembled or blended in the zone. Uh, so this is a way to really get dollars off the bottom line, cost of goods sold. Uh, for many companies, you know, they will fight very hard with their suppliers, squeeze their suppliers, some might say, to get something like 4% out of the cost of goods sold. And here's a program, a federal program, that can oftentimes uh, do that and more. In terms of the speed of the supply chain, uh, the benefits of direct delivery and weekly entry, this has nothing to do with duties. This has to do with how many inbound shipments you have in a year. And instead of filing one customs entry and the associated fees that go with that for every time you have an inbound, an inbound shipment arrive, doing one per week for everything you ship out of your zone into the U.S., 52 at most, compared to hundreds or even thousands of import entries for many importers over the course of a year. That's savings as well as consolidated reporting and increased compliance because you're now reporting to customs as the goods are leaving your zone after you've had the chance to receive and inspect them. Export promotion, we know there's a national export initiative. There's a lot of focus on exports, but we know that exports are intrinsically tied to imports. This crowd knows that, I don't have to tell you that here, but if you were to speak to a group in Washington, uh, they might not have a good understanding of that at all. So understanding that as we're promoting exports in, in the zones program, you can totally eliminate duty if you bring something into the US and then ship it up to Canada for distribution. That's your North American distribution hub and you're not incurring the cost of US duties. So lots of benefits there and the program has a major impact in export promotion. Zone to zone, this could be vertical, this could be between your suppliers and your customers, moving goods from your distribution center to somebody else's or from your production facility to somebody else's further down the supply chain to try to eliminate and defer the duties as long as possible. And then on new plants, things like production equipment and investment that can come into play as well as state inventory and property tax savings in certain states. So it's a great program. If you're not aware of it, I encourage you to look into it more. Uh, some of the industries listed are those that tend to to be the biggest users of the program, and I'll be around as well to answer questions. Thanks. Thank you, Brad.